Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we begin this new week, <clears throat> shall we seek our Heavenly Father's guidance? Shall we ask for him to reveal to us that which we need to understand so that we may more properly apply the examples in Scripture as we read them, as we see them, and may we truly begin to eat of his flesh and drink of his blood. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, as we meet together today, we understand our great need of you. We come to you because we need wisdom. We need to understand that which is being presented in your scripture of truth. I thank you for each one that is attending this meeting this morning. We ask, Father, for your blessing and for your guidance. And we claim your promise that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. Help us now and direct us. May we be edified by that which we study. May we continue to grow and walk in the path that you would set before us. To this end, we thank you. For this, we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Okay, last evening, as we've been going over several parts here in Judges 9, I was intrigued because as we look at this, we find the phrase three score and ten occurring multiple times within Scripture. But the Hebrew that is used for this is sometimes translated as 70. Why would that be? Why would um, why would they why would they have a couple times. of different why would they have a couple of different ways of translating this phrase? Instead of three score and ten, as you would see in Genesis 46, 27, in Genesis 5:12. It is 70 years. Potentially another group that had, didn't they do this in like teams when they translated it? I mean, that's just the practical thing, but we know 70 and six score or three score and 10 is 70. Three score being 60 and 10 is 70. Right. As to why I'm, I'm at a loss. Yeah, I'm not sure why the translators choose to use three score and ten instead of just 70 all the time. <clears throat> well, I'm going to ask a question. In these situations, is it possible that they were guided where we are to take note of these three score and ten where we might just gloss over? a repeated symbol of 70? Possibly. I mean, we know in the Hebrew there's no difference, but, um, yeah, they chose to translate it differently. So sometimes three score and 10, sometimes just directly as 70. Because there is no, they don't say three score and 10 in Hebrew ever. Right. So now <clears throat> the verses that are underlined are those that you would find within Crudence. It was interesting to me when I look at this that Genesis 46 27 is the first occurrence of three score and ten. 
and the sons of Joseph, which were born him in Egypt, were two souls. All the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three score and ten. Now, do we accept this as correct? Well, what do you mean, that there's 70? Yes. Well, it's correct, but there's different ways of counting this. Okay. <clears throat> right. So I think in uh, it's 72 in the New Testament when they give the same account. You know, 75? 75, okay. Yeah, I was wondering. Yeah, 75. But they're counting something different. What are they counting different? Uh, I can't remember the details of it. Stephen probably remembers. Well, okay. it says here that those who uh, came into Egypt, and uh, I think the other says something different. You know, the 75 is that they were called, those who were called, and then so 75 were called, and then 70 came. There's a possibility. Well, yeah, there's different uh, explanations of it, um, but but this is correct. Okay, now I'm I'm going to digress for a moment because I'd like to call your attention to a comment in the chat. Okay, so this is just taking your list, which is a chronological list in scriptures and it's going to be how are you getting this verses 2 4 5 18 24 uh, that's from judges 9 oh from judges 9 so in judges 9 verses 2 4 5 18 and 24 mention the three score and 10 is that what you're saying he's correct yep okay. And if you multiply those together, you get 17,280, which has all the, the numbers of July 18, 2020 in it. Yes, uh, 12 cubed is 1728. So 12 times, 12 times 100. Oh, but yeah, so that's basically like uh, the same number of 12 days and minutes. Okay. So, uh, that would be that many minutes in 12 days. Yeah, right. And if you added another day, you would have 18720. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, another. Yeah, because this is just uh, 1440 less than 18720. Right? Agreed. Okay. Okay, so my question regarding this on Genesis 4627. We are identifying here that there were two souls of Joseph that were born in Egypt. And all of the, the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were three scar and ten. Now, when we come down here, Exodus 1 5 gives an agreement to this count that all the souls which came out of the loins of Jacob were 70 souls, for Joseph was in Egypt. But when we look at Acts 7.14, then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him and all his kindred, threescore and 15 souls. Uh -huh. Why is there a difference of five people? We can understand that there could be a difference of four with Joseph. Why the additional person? Well, there's different solutions that people have figured out for this. Okay. I don't know necessarily which is the correct answer. It's a point that some may come back to in the future and say that the scripture is in error, that there are 
disagreements within scripture, therefore we should set it aside. How we answer for this will be very important. And it's just an example of something that we may need to look at. Now, as I continued through this, Exodus 15, 27, and they came to Elim, where there were 12 wells of water and three score and 10 palm trees, and they encamped there by the waters. <clears throat> three score and 10, again, becomes noted. So we have 12 wells <clears throat> and 70 trees. Now, Deuteronomy 10.22 becomes the next, or excuse me, Numbers 33.9. And they removed from Marah and came unto Elim. And in Elim there were 12 fountains of water and three score and 10 palm trees. And they pitched there. <clears throat> so we have this situation that in Exodus, Elim is noted. And in Numbers, it is noted. Mm -hmm. And these two encampments are several years apart. Then we come to Deuteronomy. And the fathers went down into Egypt with three score and ten persons. Now the Lord thy God hath made thee as the stars of heaven for multitude. Here is Moses referencing three score and ten, not the three score and 15. We come here now into the book of Judges. And Adonai Bezek said, three score and 10 kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their meal under my table as I have done. So God has requited me and they brought him to Jerusalem and there he died. Judges 8.30, as we have referenced several times. And Gideon had three score and 10 sons of his body begotten for he had many wives. Now in Judges 9, as was pointed out, we have three score and 10 that are giving reference to all of this with the sons of Gideon. Of, <clears throat> of which Abimelech is going to slay 69. Okay. Now, how come you didn't underline Judges 9.18? I believe, I, I would look again, but I believe that that one was not occurring in Cruden's, but let me look. Oh, I see. It's just that Cruden's has it. Okay, then I, I made a mistake. No, no, I'm just saying that's why you're underlining it. Right. Even though they both say three score and ten. Correct. So, okay. So Cruden's doesn't have every occurrence. No. Okay. Okay. So as we go further into this, it is not until almost the end of Judges 9 before 70 is used rather than three score and 10. Right. So there we, that's why we're not using that in the calculation. Of right. One, seven, uh, two, eight, zero. Okay. Now, Judges 12, 14. And he had 40 sons and 30 nephews that rode on three score and 10 ass colts. And he judged Israel for eight years.
it's interesting when we when we get to this part of the study as to how the sons and nephews are translated in different ways, but still that they rode on three score and ten ass colts becomes a point of symbolism that we will be getting into when we get to Judges 12. And we have here in Second Chronicles, three score and 10 bullocks, which were offered as an offering. And in Second Chronicles 36, 21, to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbath. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and 10 years. Yeah, which quit, quotes Leviticus 26, verse 34 and 35. Right. But the gives the duration of that uh, seven times. And when we look at this in the book of Daniel, in Daniel 9, they quote it there as 70 years rather than three score and 10. Yeah. Psalm 90, verse 10. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. Zechariah 1, 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these threescore and ten years? And then Acts 23, 23 concludes those verses that were seen by Cruden. And he called unto him two centurions, saying, Make ready 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea and horsemen three score and 10 and spearmen 200 at the third hour of the night. This was being commanded to protect Paul from the Jews. 200, three score and 10, 200. All of these have an impact in what we are studying, <clears throat> in what we are looking at, and in the symbols that we are applying within this portion of Judges. I looked at this and thought it was something worthy of note for us to consider because we may find even more in these verses dealing with three score and 10 so that we may more properly apply the symbols that we are finding. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so just to go back to uh, Genesis 46, uh, 27, where it says that there's 70 who came into Egypt now, Stephen is, or Stephen, is quoting the Septuagint. And in the Septuagint, it says there's 75. Right. But when you go to the Septuagint and you go to Genesis 46, 20, um, they actually add some information in the Septuagint that's not in, in the, the King James. It's not in the Hebrew. Okay. Septuagint, it's a Greek translation. Right. Uh, so Genesis 46, 20 uh, if you go there, it says, and to Joseph in the land of Egypt were born Manasseh and Ephraim, whom Asaiah, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore to him. In the Septuagint, it adds five other people. And there were sons born to Joseph in the land of Egypt, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of Heliopolis, Petaphiris, priest of Heliopolis, bore to him. Manasseh and Ephraim, 
And there were sons born to Manasseh, which the Syrian concubine bore to him, Maker. And Maker begot Galaad, the sons of Ephraim, the brothers of Manasseh, Sutalaam and Ta'am, and the sons of Sutalaam, Edom. So when they give the count in the Septuagint, they're including these five sons of Manasseh or descendants of Manasseh and Ephraim, which uh, the Hebrew doesn't include. Okay. So that would be the simple explanation. That's the most common explanation I've seen. Are they saying that one of the sons is of Manasseh? Um, let me see here. Yeah. And there were sons born to Manasseh and and then sons born to Ephraim. So they got three of them born. Uh, let me see here. You got Manasseh has um, Gala, Galaad through, um, uh, well, he has Maker and Galaad, Galaad, and then the sons of Ephraim. Anyway, that's what it says in the Septuagint. And yes. so, so that's what Stephen is quoting. Is this, is this this is applying to the second year of the famine? Is not correct. Um, in Genesis forty six twenty. Are these are these yes? So that's the uh, the second year of the famine. These year seventy souls are coming to join with Joseph. Right. Okay, so Manasseh and Ephraim, they wouldn't be much more than like six or seven years old. Agreed. Right, I understand that. So in, in other words, we're looking at two different time periods. Stephen, before he is stoned, is referring to those that were coming out of Egypt where this in Genesis 46 is referring to those that came into Egypt. Yes, that's that's my understanding. So we would be looked, we'd be able to look at this as a beginning and an ending. Could be, um, but, there, but there's other explanations that people have. Um, to try to explain it. I mean, in Jacob's family, you actually have 66 people in total. Um, so you have 66 children, the grandchildren, great grandchildren. We had Jacob, Joseph, and his two sons. The amount is 70. That's the whole amount that's settled in Egypt. Kind of interesting that they're not counting Joseph's wife. Well, because he married her in, she was an Egyptian. But would she not have been part of their family by, because yeah. of Yeah, but she doesn't come into <clears throat> Egypt. Right. Right. Just a slight technicality there. Yeah. Right. So it's just, I, I just found this and I was intrigued by it. Mm. Yeah, but we know the Septuagint does some interpreting when it's translated uh, into the into the Latin from from the from the Hebrew. Okay. Or Greek, I guess it's the Greek, not the Latin. From the Greek, from the Hebrew. Um, so it does some interpreting and so, but they have there in that verse that they're going to have 75 people, but they also are counting differently. So why that is, I have no idea why the Septuagint translators choose to translate and interpret the Hebrew. It's, uh, how reliable is that Septuagint? Because when you do the uh, chronology yeah. of those before the flood, it just mm -hmm. works out that Methuselah dies 14 years after the flood. Yeah, I know. Yeah. And then you have this year's story, you have all these 
70 Jews, basically all coming together, well, sort of in their own translating the scriptures together. And then um, at the same time, I mean, and then they bring their translations and everyone's the same. It's like some miraculous translation that they've done. Yeah, which I don't think is correct. No, no. I think it's uh, <laughs> something that the Catholic Church would come up with, you know, during the Middle Ages. Yeah. No, I know. So, um, so you know, the Septuagint isn't reliable, but it was still used at the time of Christ. Okay. Right. So it was, and and also you have the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch as well, would have existed at that time. So it has some similarities to the Septuagint. So these are things that you know Satan has brought in to confuse people. But um, when we look at uh, the seventy-five that's mentioned in Acts seven fourteen, when Stephen is speaking. Um, there's an explanation for it. It's not a contradiction of the scriptures because it is a different perspective when he says 75. That's all I'm saying. However, somebody wants to solve that problem, uh, you know, he's, he's not giving you false information. It's not a contradiction. No, I, the, the whole point of bringing this up is to be able to show that these things do exist within scripture and that we need to be able to salt this away so when we are confronted by those that deny the validity of scripture we have a method of being able to approach it well well that's partly true i don't think that you know the skeptic is ever going to be uh satisfied with any explanation that we give agreed um i think it's more important for ourselves to understand uh as ellen white says i mean there are because it's human language and there's is real people involved that not everything that you see in the bible when somebody makes a statement that he's necessarily correct um but there, there's always a reason that it's there, you know. And we looked to before at how Ellen White uh, gets the the year of her baptism wrong. Well, you know, she has a faulty memory. She's a human being. But we wouldn't use that to say, well, Ellen White's not a prophet because she remembers something wrong. Uh, another one that she brought up herself was when she. Uh, talked about the number of rooms at uh, Battle Creek uh, Sanitarium. Um, and somebody said that she was incorrect. Well, she said, well, I was just giving the number that was given to me. Um, you know, and it was off by a little bit, you know. And also, how do you define a room is also another question. I remember when I was in uh, uh, elementary school and they asked the question, how many rooms were in my house? And I think it was something like 25 rooms, but I was counting the closets as a room and, uh, you know, every little tiny room I counted as a room. So, um, you know, it, it all depends how a person's perspective. But anyway, the point is when it's talking about the 75 souls, it's using the count, including those five who went into that, that, uh, came out of Egypt, so of that of that group. So it's counting 75, not um, 70 in Acts 7.14. That's one explanation. But you're never going to satisfy, uh, not only are you not going to satisfy everyone, sometimes there's just things that we can't find an answer to <coughs> when we're studying the scriptures. We just don't have an answer to. And if... And what I generally do with things that I don't have an answer to is I leave them on the back burner. I'm always aware of them. And then often when I do find the answer, it's something that I wouldn't expect that gives me other information. Um, so I never try to just resolve every, 
if, if I don't have enough information to draw a conclusion, I generally don't. I've, I'll be aware that there is these different solutions, but I don't just stick to something because, you know, I have to answer everything. I don't. Um, just a point that I noted was that uh, Abram is uh, 75 when he leaves Haran, and that's the 215 years the journey in Canaan begins. Yeah. But he, uh, the understanding is that he left Ur when he was 70. Mm -hmm. So you have a 70 and 75 mm -hmm. um, years connected with the beginning of the 215 years sojourning in Canaan. Yeah. And here we have 75 souls and 70 souls mm -hmm. being connected with the 215 years of sojourning in Egypt. Mm hmm yeah, so there's so there's this symbolism there. So even though it, we, you know, somebody could say, well, it's, you know, the translators of Septuagint who created that problem, um, we can see that God's hands in it. So there's there's a reason for it. Yes, and uh, Jacob, when the sojourning in Egypt begins, he's 130 years old, and uh, Abram. His father, Terah, was 130 years old when the, the 70 years and 75 years of his life began, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so there's lots of these little things that show up. Okay, thanks for that, Stephen. Nicely done. Okay. Now, to recap where we were this last week, we were finishing off this portion of Judges 9. If ye then have, dwelt, have dealt truly and sincerely with Jeroboam and his house this day, then rejoice ye in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out of Abimelech, and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo. And let fire come out from the men of Shechem and from the house of Milo and devour Abimelech. Now, did literal fire come out of Abimelech or did literal fire come out from the men of Shechem to devour Abimelech? I don't think so. So we have a symbolism here. We could call this a prophecy of mutually assured destruction. If you have not dealt truly and sincerely with the house of Gideon, this is what's going to happen to you. If you have dealt truly and sincerely with the house of Gideon, then rejoice in your choice. Uh -huh. As in, be glad that you've made this choice and support him in all that he does. So in giving this prophecy, We are told, and Jotham ran away and fled and went to Beir and dwelt there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. Now, is this term running away and fled? Is that not another style of a doubling? Well, I guess it's a style of it. It's not the same word, of course. It's not exact same, but it, it is a style. Definitely. Okay. So here we have a situation that we could apply that Jotham 
is giving the first and the second angel's message to the men of Shechem and to Abimelech. They're being told to fear God. They're being told to give glory to God, yet they are giving glory to Abimelech. And as we continue further in this chapter, we're going to find that they feared Abimelech. Now, here we are told in Judges 9.22, when Abimelech had reigned three years over Israel, then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech. Why is this important for us to note? Is this not causing a division between Abimelech and Shechem and the men of Shechem? Yeah. Now, we still have these three years to address. Okay, then let's address them. So Abimelech, so this is a message, which we we attribute to our time. Right. And it's the message that is a counterfeit uh, fourth angel's message, maybe, or third angel's message, um, that rejects July 18th rejects right. the message of Gideon, and it occurs for three years. So I de dealt with it a little bit on Friday evening, but um, where would we place this three years? Are we just going to take it as a symbol? Um, because we know we already have three days as a symbol. In, because we use that from the story of Ezra chapter 10, the three days connected with the 20th day of the ninth month. Are we going to place it there or where are we going to place it? Well, How do you understand this symbol? The, the comment that I had made when you were asking that question Mm -hmm. Just to ask whether we could apply this in 2018. And I believe the response was that we should be looking to apply this as of July 18th of 2020. Yeah, so, so my suggestion is that it would occur after July 18, just the context of this whole story of where we're placing it. I mean, if we started in, in 2018, we would start with you know, October 13th going up to December uh, December uh, 25th, 2021 or something like that. But, you know, whether we need to actually place it as three years or not is still a question, whether it just exists as a symbol of the three days okay. from the story of Ezra. Because the three days we do take basically as symbolizing July 18, uh, 2020 to December 25th, 2021. So we would take these three years and symbolically place them there as well. Or would we symbolically place this as going from July 18th of 2020 to bring us into a point in 2023? Yeah, so we could go all the way to 2023. We could say from, you know, from 2020 to 2023. So that would be July 18th, 2020 to January 11th, 2020. 23. That would be our period of three years. Now, symbolically, three years, if we take a prophetic year, it's going to be 1,080 days. And that's the number of um, 
for the for the Jews, that's the number of parts in the Hebrew hour. So number of helic that they put in the Hebrew hour it is 1,080 parts. Each of those being um, three and a third seconds in length. All right, so that's why in um, so. So we have that symbol also in Acts chapter 27. So we could just take it as a symbol of time. When we have to take it as a symbol of time? Well, I'm just saying, well, yeah, we can. I mean, saying we just would take it as a symbol of dealing with time. It's just, it could be just a symbol of how we understand time, the chronology. Or are we going to take it and use it in some sort of literal fashion is, is the question. That we're going to take that period and, and apply it in some way. No, just... Okay. So, I mean, I, I can't, you know, literally to take three years as, as a literal, you know, from one date to another, I can't find a way in which I would do that. But I can at least look at it as that span of time from 2020 to 2023 as being three years as well. So whether that applies or whether both apply, um, the thing is, we can say that the three years, because we already have the three days, at least should represent um, the message that's going to end at, after a period of three years. So we know at some point that this message will then be rejected. You know, and, and specifically, I'm saying the message that Trump's going to become president again. And that, you know, we're going to have a Sunday law in 2022. At some point, um, people are going to be dissatisfied with that message. Presumably after it fails. Right. And this would be consistent with what I've been saying from the beginning, is that we still have to come to the upper room. I mean... It, as this movement, this movement has to complete its work, and in order for it to do that, it has to, the people in the movement have to come into unity, and that we could, we could say that that's still going to be future, and trust that God's going to work this out, however that happens. We're not look. <clears throat> we're not looking at that long of a time period right now, because 2020 is well past. Mm -hmm. We are now in this in 2022, and we are seeing different issues within the movement, as we've been pointing out for several weeks. Mm -hmm. because the unity that is needed so that the final message can go out is not yet occurring. Yeah, and it's not an us and them uh, no. sort of issue. We're not looking for a division to happen and, you know, we're in the right and other people are in the wrong. Uh, we're looking at however, however it happens, that first it starts with us as individuals being obedient to God, and what we know to be true, and praying for each other, and looking to reconcile, uh, because we believe that this is God's movement, and that the division that exists is something that's temporary, and it's not of God.
Okay, any other thoughts or comments with this? Well, the other point is that we do have this fire and we can see that the fire can be symb symbolic of the message of Nashville. Right. And so maybe there's some connection there um, as far as how, how unity comes about in this movement. I don't know, but you know, it's something that's there as a symbol. How we would apply that, I don't, I don't have the answer. Well, since we step back a little bit in this in this situation, when Jotham ran away mm -hmm. and fled, he went to beer. Right, which we didn't really address. And. Is beer here being referenced as the well? Well, this is the well, and the suggestion that this is the well um, that we had in um, with Moses, because that's going to be in Numbers. Where is it? Numbers. I have to find this again. Um, numbers 21, 16. Um, and from thence they went to beer, that is the well whereof the Lord spake unto Moses, gather the people together and I will give them water. Right. And now the translators made use of 2 Samuel 20, 14. And he went through all the tribes of Israel unto Abel and to Beth Makaha and all the Beerites. And they were gathered together and went also after him. So Jotham runs away to the well. He's going where there is water. Is he then fleeing to the living water as a symbol? Well, if we're taking Numbers 21, 16, this is referring back to Numbers 20, dealing with where um, take the rod, gather the, the assembly together, thou Aaron and thy brothers, speak ye unto the rock before their eyes, and it shall give forth his water, and thou shalt bring forth unto them out of the rock. So shalt thou give the congregation and their beasts drink. So, so this is, um, and in this account here, this is going to be where Moses strikes the rock. So this is going to actually going to be Moses's rebellion in Numbers twenty. But that's, um, but this is giving us back to this, uh, and of course we could go back to the original story. Um, but this is where the message of Jotham flees to. Right, because this is about a message. Right. And so if it's fleeing to uh, this where the water comes from the rock, what what is the message doing? What is the message of jo jo Jotham doing in, in this time? Would it be returning to the foundations? Right. So it's going back and it's examining... The foundation of this message trying to understand the basis for the message in the first place and in that it's going to receive this living water but there is a temptation that moses experienced which we can't we can't succumb to and that is the smiting of the rock Right, we're supposed to speak to the rock. But the temptation is to smite the rock. Right. Now, in this case, Moses does smite the rock. And, and if we do the same thing, wouldn't that be true of what happened to Moses happened to this movement? Well, isn't that the uh, the connotations there? I mean, um, we're supposed to be 
removing the mistakes and not making the same mistakes. Yeah, we're supposed to learn from the mistakes. Yeah, but how do we actually do that? I mean, I get the um, talking to the rock as opposed to smiting the rock. Right? In other words, we don't we don't get angry with them and and thrash them for what their errors. We talk to them and speak to them in a um, in through scriptural matters, right? Mm -hmm. I think yep. that's what we're doing now. I mean, it's it's just my opinion, but things have seemed to calm down a little bit um, throughout the groups. They're starting to top more interactively. Yeah, and that, you know, that that's, of course, our prayer. And our, you know, we want to see, we don't want to create controversy. And, you know, and I've struggled with this, and what is my responsibility? And all I keep coming back to is we just need to keep studying and to leave the things in God's hands that we have no control over. Right. So um, how does this relate to chapter 4, verse 24? Of, of, of Judges? Yeah, as we're talking about Judges 9 now, um, yeah. how would this relate to uh, Judges 4, 24? I think so it was 24. Hand, well, that Judge, was the last uh, verse, right? Yeah, the hand of the children of Israel prospered and, and prevailed against and, Jabin. The king I, and I do remember what we were Jabin. talking about as far as what that, the connotations of that uh, that that whole chapter there, mm -hmm. and so again, what's the what's the um, connection between those that that chapter and verse and this? Well, we believe that God's message will prevail. I think. So. Well, I don't think so. I know so. It's just how you know. That's what we're we're watching for. Yeah, and, and so to understand our responsibility is we can see that God is showing that there will be the downfall of Abimelech, which is within this movement. A message, which is a, a message, message. That, that is a counterfeit. Right. And we're not talking about the people. We're just talking about a message that exists. The message. Yeah. The message. Yeah, it's, not, it's not the people. It's the message. Yeah. And and we've kind of lost sight of that before, and we're kind of focusing in on that now um, because, you know, it, it's always been about the message and not necessarily about the people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we're not, you know, no way are we trying to condemn people because of what they believe. God is doing, a, he's trying to restore us through a three-step testing prophetic message. Right. And, and that there is a message that is incorrect People are giving it, but in some way it's understandable because yes. we're trying to sort through our disappointment. The same thing happened in Millerite history. Right. The question is, you know, for us individually, are we going to allow the the third angel's message or the, the three angels' messages to do their work upon us to prepare us to give a message? That's really the question we have to ask ourselves, that everyone has to ask. So, so this three years to me is this period of time in which we are in presently, but we know that it's coming to an end. Yes, yeah. I agree. Okay. <laughs> uh, don't let me forget. I, I, I want to review something with you guys at the end of this, um, this whole this study here. Okay. Okay, Dwight. Okay, so we have a message of Jotham. We have a, a counter message with Abimelech. We are applying this and applying these symbols to delve into the message and their import for us today. We have now this symbol of Abimelech reigning three years over Israel. 
So the question becomes, is this going to be seen as a literal time period within the movement today within this false message? Or that's brought forward by this false message? Yeah. Well, it's definitely, I can't find it literally in the sense of three literal years, but we can see it in the, in the that the three years do exist within right. the predictions that are being made since July 18th. Okay. Now, when we were talking July 18th of 2020, you, in, in this conversation, you made the, the comment that this would take us to like January of 2023? Yeah, January 11th is where Collins' structure would end if he actually put the dates in there. Okay. Which is after the uh, verse 24, right? Of four, uh, chapter four, verse 24. Yeah. Because that takes us to the end of uh, 2022. Yeah. Right? Yeah, into 2023. So January yeah. 2023. Mm -hmm. I agree. After reflecting upon it. Yeah. Okay. Now, again... Then God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem. And the men of Shechem dwelt treacherously with Abimelech. So there is a division within the false message. Would that be a fair application? There's a what in the false message? There's a division within the false message. Within the false message itself. Correct. Would, yes. that, would that be a fair application? I would say so, that there, there becomes a division within the false message. I mean, those that are believing the false message, um, there are some that are going to be lost because of that false message. Not necessarily because of it, but it will demonstrate their character when that prediction fails that is they will abandon the message the, all of the message is, is that some that, there be some that want to uh, move forward and understand why yeah yeah so so many people will also um go back and examine why they were wrong and and be corrected but we're also being corrected too, right? Yes, so, correct. So yes. it's not like yeah, definitely. You know, we're right. This is both. his program, not ours. We're just guessing at a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, yes, they are educated guesses, but um, we're still basically guessing at, at not all of this, but some of this, and because we really don't know. But as time progresses, we under start to be really start to understand, especially as we're going through these verses. The way yeah. in which we do yeah and we know from early writings page 74 uh when ellen white condemns time setting one of the persons who was still time setting was joseph bates mm. right when we look at that history that he was he was looking at seven years from 1844 so he was looking at the 1851 date in november that that ellen white is referring to people were setting time and 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 some of the other errors that were existing at that time as well but we know that not all those people who were caught up in those errors ended up being lost joseph bates being one of them um because it was a period of time in which they were trying to sort through the disappointment of october 22nd 1844 and this was a group that all accepted october 22nd 1844 as a valid date, right? So they had accepted the seventh month movement, the people who were following Alan White, but they also were caught up in other errors. Well, that, that date ended up being a testing date anyway, at that point, 
which was designed by God um, to happen. And those that uh, accepted it moved on with it. And those that didn't moved out. Yeah. So just because somebody comes up with a solution, they're trying to maintain or hold on to uh, what had gone before. Um, there are going to be different solutions, but in the end, the truth is the one that will win out. And that's why I persist in saying that the only way that we really, when we have an inkling of the idea of what's going on, but until the event actually passes, we really don't know. And we are just guessing at that point, but once the date goes by, we're given some sort of assurance as to whether it was right or whether it was wrong. Yeah. Uh, and then we start yeah. to see our the details of you know the things that we actually missed like when the millerites uh messed up they realized that god had his hand over uh some figures mm -hmm. on the chart and until his hand was removed which was the during that tarrying time right yeah they in, figured in, they figured it out yeah so, and, and I just see that as just a way to encourage us to not lose hope that we can, we will figure this out at God's, at God's timing, not our timing. Right. And we need to follow the counsel that was given to us. That's right. The example of the Millerites that they spent their time studying together. And at this point, you know, the movement is, is divided, which it was in Ellen White's day as well. But we can't just write off the other other people or even uh, consider that we are just the ones in the know. <laughs> but, so no, we can't, we I mean, literally, we cannot uh, think that because uh, don't we always find something out, you know, more than what we actually thought. I mean, that's been the, the consistent uh, pattern. And mm -hmm. I choose my words carefully there yeah so so we can see anyway from this that there is this false message now the men of shechem of course this isn't necessarily representing any particular people and this and, is the ridge and, this is the neck that's exposed that takes the burdens well but when we look at the men of shechem shechem symbolizes what a ridge okay but well this is going to be the blessings and the curses, right? This is this covenant. This is this special place. You know, we study the history of Shechem and we can see that this represents in a sense, the movement as a whole. Yes. That is going to enter into covenant with God. And that has the understanding of the blessings and the curses, the 2520. Right. Right. So, so the symbol there, symbolism there of Shechem, is not like to single out a group of people that we're going to label as the ones who believed Abimelech or anything like that. But it's going to address the symbolism of this message. I agree. Yeah. Now we do know that the men of Shechem are going to um, be, involved, be involved in supporting the killing of the brethren, right? But what remains is this Jotham, who is the 70th week, the message of the 70th week, that's going to point us to the future and shows us that the message of Abimelech is a false message. Hmm. Right. So the message of 2030 is a message that God gave us from the week of Christ back in 2018 and has been witnessed to that this is the message that God has given us to bring about the unity in this movement. Mm. When, when this message of Trump fails, we still have a reason that if people are willing to study, that we can go back and examine um, to know that God had not abandoned us. Um, but that's going to be up to each individual, where, whether they're converted or not. Um, to continue studying, to humble themselves, as all of us have to, um, to be taught of God, right? 
and we have to come to that upper room experience. Because if we don't have the upper room experience, we will not receive the outpouring of the spirit, right? Yeah, correct. Now we're gonna find some interesting things as we go through these verses that I still haven't fully understood how we would interpret them. Okay. So with that note, uh, we are still coming across symbols that we don't recognize. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I I'll tell you later, but um, I'm just going to say it, say that at that point, at this point. Yeah, I'm sorry. Continue, Dwight. No problem. That the cruelty done to the three score and ten sons of Jerubal might come, and their blood be laid upon Abimelech their brother, which slew them. And upon the men of Shechem, which aided him in the killing of his brethren. Now, the alternate Hebrew would render it in this way that the cruelty done to the three score and ten sons of Jerubal might come, and their blood be laid upon Abimelech, their brother which slew them, and upon the men of Shechem, which strengthened his hands to kill his brethren. Now, when you're strengthening a message, when you're, when you're saying that the message is correct, even when it is a false message, are you not leading others astray? Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah. Now, at this point, the application that we that was presented, that I presented before you, was that Abimelech was a false three angels, third angels message. Mm-hmm. As a false third angel's message, you have the two components. You have the judgment that is coming, mm. and you have the health message. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that this strengthening of Abimelech's hand is giving us a reference to the symbol of strengthening the right arm of the gospel in a false method. Mm. Um, the more I look at that, after you have made this statement uh, or asked this question, I, uh, I, I really want to say yes, that um, that's a possibility. I mean, at this, at this point, we have so many that are willing to come out to say, here is the health message. Mm. Yet the health message as they are presenting it is very different from that which has been presented by Mrs. White. Mm -hmm. mm. I agree. Now, if it is different from what is presented by Mrs. White, is this not cruelty to those that are hearing it because they are presenting a, a false method of attempting a health message uh, yeah, um, somewhat yes I would after looking at it carefully I would have to say yeah um, and, and yesterday I had a um, 
I had mentioned to uh, the group that was at the church services yesterday, well, um, the virtual church services, about that very subject um, about, you know, how some uh, get a little bit carried away with the message of uh, the health reform message and um, openly make comments that uh, they're okay with not uh, doing the studies like we do them, I mean, which is, I, I mean, I get understand. I understand why some people don't study le- daily, but wasn't that um, <laughs> an admonishment to uh, the followers of Christ to be like those um, that study every day? What was that? The Bereans. The Bereans. I'm sorry? The Bereans. The Bereans. The Bereans, that's it. That was it. The Bereans. Um, and I mean, and you have to you know, study to see what, and you have to study to see whether the things are so or not. That, and that's, well, that's the terminology inside that, inside that verse that I was just thinking about in, um, for the Bereans to see if those things were true or not. And I want to put emphasis on the are not. You have to study to see if those things are true and you can't forget any of the rest of the parts. That's why we need to study in groups like this. So reminding, you know, cause I forget about something things and then Theodore reminds us, you know, uh, and then you have to, Oh, Oh yeah, that's right. You know, so you don't go in that other direction. You know, that's why we need these group studies like this. It's, um, it's almost yeah. imperative. We just can't all think about all this stuff. You well, know, you know, and I've run into people who run into an error, and it's a common error, that we need to study for ourselves, which is true. But, and, and there are people who have been following this message who have stopped studying with us because they say, well, God can show me I need to study this out on my own. I shouldn't be studying with the group. And... If this were the case, because we'll see people, and and they will go out and they will share information, say, well, we all need to study for ourselves. And I say, well, why are you sharing information then? If you believe that you only need to study on your own, then I would only need to study on my own, and I shouldn't listen to anything you have to say. I would also like to point out that the... um... The pioneers did gang studies like this, mm-hmm. um, for, uh, you know, in, into the in, wee in, hours in, of the night. Yeah, prior to prior to the making of the 1850 chart. That, that's right. Every day. Mm-hmm. I mean, at least that's what the impression I got from reading the the different yeah. uh, uh, the different people on the on that particular subject. Yeah. So they were studying, and and the, when they had differences. And things got a little heated. Uh, they spent some time apart in prayer and self-examination, right? To come together to again in a again in a right spirit. That's right. And and they didn't push away the others because they had got upset or something. Um, they recognized the responsibility to study together. Just because I you agree. have differences doesn't mean you don't study together. That's right. It's just not, it, it's not the precedence of the Bible that, that's yeah. saying that. And Ellen White says, if a brother differ, you know, don't make him out to be a heretic. Don't that's you right. know, represent his words, but take the time to, to study with him, going over everything point by point to show if he is in error, because you may not understand everything fully. And he says, to, if he asks you to walk with him one, walk with him two, right? And that's what we're. That's that's how I see that. Is when I walk with them, that's how I'm. I'm walking through the scriptures. Now, when we look at these next verses, so the one thing you know we can say is that God is leading this movement, but we Absolutely. can't. Also, we also can't take the position that that this these errors are not dangerous. There will be casualties um, with what is being taught. Yeah, we call in it friendly this, fire in the military. In this movement that is is error, which is 
you know, why we will repent when we see what we have done that is wrong. That's right. And, and we're going to see this in the next part of this story. So, Dwight, you want to go on? Well, I'm just seeing that there's quite a bit, really, that we're looking at within these within these two verses that are here. Yeah. I mean, when God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, mm. the translators gave reference to 1 Samuel 16, 14, and 18, 9, and 10. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. Was the spirit of the Lord ever upon Abimelech? As we are seeing it in this story. Um, well, if you look at the bit. other verses, that yes, it's a possibility there. Probable at one time. But Abimelech has chosen his own path. He has chosen not to follow after God. Yeah, I don't Is think it before Abimelech, or after. I don't think Abimelech was following God at all in what he was doing. Because this is a false message. Right. Okay. Yeah. Understandable. Now in Saul in 1 Samuel 18, 9 and 10. And Saul eyed David from that day and forward. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul and that he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times. And there was a javelin in Saul's hand. David is trying to, to soothe Saul. Here you have one that has been blessed of God, but chose a different path, and one that is blessed of God and is seeking to walk in all ways in that path. So with those two examples, is there a false message from Saul and a true message from David? Can we make that application with what we're seeing here in the book of Judges? Yep. So this, when we're looking further, that these men of Shechem are now going to, after supporting Abimelech, have made the decision now to deal treacherously with him. So the men of Shechem are choosing to abandon the false message. Would yeah. that be a correct application? Yeah. Now, some of them, of course, are going to go even further in their rejection. Right. Agreed. Right. So, so that's part of the danger that we're going to see when we study this tomorrow. Right. Is, um, because we, we are coming close to our time today. Yeah. Now, Brother Ron, you had mentioned that you wanted to address something further earlier in the meeting. Yeah. Um, so last night, uh, do you guys know Brother Brian um, Wiltham, I think his name is? Okay, so is this something we want to... Uh, uh... I'm not going to complain about anything, but it's just something that uh, he brought up yesterday that was very interesting. And um, are you guys familiar with the FFA banners, uh, what's that, chap? Yeah, they, they uh, kicked me out. <laughs> did they <laughs> okay <laughs> um i didn't i didn't realize that yeah. um but uh they came up with a couple of numbers uh n what was it it was nine and twelve that uh, uh they seem to think may be a key of something uh i just wanted you to be aware of this 
Yeah, um, this group, well, this group is full of fanaticism. It was started by uh, 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 Caleb, Captain Caleb. Caleb, he, yeah. He passed away um, back uh, last year, um, sadly. But, um, but yeah, so it was started by him, and it's continued a lot of fanaticism. Yeah, um, I get that. But and I I've been you know I've I've not follow them very closely but uh, when things come up and they're mentioned I mean I perk up and I pay attention because we're always looking for that kind of stuff that other people have come up with and then we can actually look at to see if there's anything to it. Mm-hmm. Um, I got a few things I want to ship over to you uh, in an email. A little later, I'll, I'll send it to you too, Dwight. Um, okay. It was a, a series of texts that he brought up, and um, the most prevalent thing that I got out of that was the symbol symbology of the numbers nine, or I'm sorry, was it nine? It was seven and twelve, um, and they were also connected nineteen to it because seven plus. 12 is 19. Well, and, and that's the metonic cycle. 19 years, there's seven emboli- embolismic years and 12 uh, uh, c- common years. That kind of makes more sense now. Um, but I'll ship these things over to you so you can actually read them. If you've been cut from that uh, particular uh, WhatsApp chat, um, I have a bunch. I, I, I'm on that group. I mean... Yeah. I don't post very often, like I've done it twice, you know, thanks for being here and something else I can't even remember. Yeah, and I don't know why they kicked me off. I mean, I wrote Brian and asked him, he never responded um, because I wasn't, you know, belligerent or anything. Uh, Bro, haven't you figured it out yet? This is all in God's hands. It's so we can, you've, you've studied this. You've even actually come up with some of the answers to it. Yeah, I'm just listening. You know, I'm just paying attention. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying. And watching these it, it things. Really so make much, it didn't really make much sense for them to. Well, uh, uh, out of so the I also found out the other day that um, I'm still on one of the chats uh, from FFA, the FFA Alpha Group. But well, they don't. So have any, they don't do anything, do they? Uh, I've yeah. They they there's something going on there. There's um, I've got a lot of you know, uh, text that I didn't even know I had, uh, because I, I don't really do the WhatsApp thing. Um, because there's too much on there. You know what I'm saying? There's too many comments and just way too much stuff going on. Um, so I try to tend to focus on my, I think that's kind of a distraction. Uh, my focus is on the studies. Yeah. Well, I think people misuse the WhatsApp. So uh, it's post tons and tons of stuff, which is not, yes. It should be for uh, discussion and information that's relevant, but people post all kinds of irrelevant things on yes. some, some of the the chats. The Unity one's pretty good. We don't get well. It. Yeah, I'm, I've got the Unity, and I actually pay attention to that a lot more. But I, I don't post very much. I, I try not okay. to. Okay. Anyway, so we do that. To, I'll send you that stuff. Here. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. So Dwight. Okay. I'm just making a quick note. So, okay. Any other comments or any other thoughts? No. Not for me. Okay. We will return to these verses tomorrow. Shall we now close with prayer? Mm -hmm. Gracious Father in heaven, help us, Father that we may be able to separate truth from error. Mm -hmm. Guide us, please, Mm -hmm. in the path that you would have us to walk. Show us that that we need so that our characters may become more like yours. Direct us through this day so that others may see you in all the things that we do. May your will be done. May we understand your guidance and make use of that 
which we are reading and learning. I thank you for each one. I thank you for the conversations today, for all of the subjects that we have addressed. Help us now to go forward and be prepared for the work that you would have us to do. For this, we thank you and this we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother Dwight.